Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Martin Westgate. I lead the Science and Decision Support Team for the Atlas of Living Australia. And this is our last webinar for 2021. Very glad you could join us. Um, before we get started, I'd like to uh, acknowledge that I'm calling you from uh, CSIRO Black Mountain, which is in Canberra, which is, of course, in Nunnawal. Nunnawal in every country. I'd like to acknowledge that and acknowledge the, uh, the, um, that this is Nunnawal country and that they... Um, uh, and the importance of their leaders, past, present, and emerging. Today, we've got a bunch of speakers for you that I'm really excited to introduce. Um, and it's about a topic that is very uh, important to us at the Atlas, but that we don't always um, promote too much for some reason. I'm not quite sure why that is, but here's an attempt to address it. And it's basically that we're an e-infrastructure. So we, um, our largest, uh, we're, we're a website, we're a database, but we, uh, we're, and we're software developers. And... What's interesting is the, there's, we, we support through that work a huge amount of science and a huge amount of outreach and a huge amount of, um, uh, of uh, support for, for government decision making. And we're very proud of that, that legacy, but it builds upon a huge amount of, of research and effort that goes into building and maintaining that infrastructure and into developing new ways of coding. And so um, we're here today to hear from uh, some of the people who are really on the front lines of that sort of work and, and working out how... Um, software can be built in such a way as to support those activities, uh, and particularly in the environmental sector, though not, though not exclusively. And so today we're here to talk, hear from uh, three speakers. We've got uh, Ave Soland up in Brisbane, who's here from EcoCommons. Uh, we've got Anna Belgan from uh, Data61, also here in Canberra. And then we've got um, Mars Nichols, who's a colleague of mine at the Atlas of Living Australia. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Before I hand over to our first speaker, which will be Ave. Um, I, there's a few administrative points I'd like to raise. So um, if you're in the portal, I think you'll be doing this through. There should be some things on, on um, that you can see besides the video. Uh, there's a chat function. We'd love to um, hear from you. We'll be monitoring that. Um, if, you've, uh, if you want to say hello, say where you're calling in from, it's always nice to know. Um, if you have any questions for the speakers, we have time for discussion at the end. So um, we'll uh, accumulate those questions and try and ask as many as we can, though usually we have more than we can ask in the time. But we also have a poll, which is just some, some administrative things. If you want to tell us more about yourself, we'd love to hear that. So feel free to fill in the poll at any time. But the format here is that each of our speakers will have uh, 12, 15 minutes or so to, to tell us about their particular application. I'm really excited to hear today about some of the, the work that's gone into each of the platforms that our speakers are here to talk about. So, um, Ave, I'd like to hand over to you first, if that's all right. Are you able to share your slides? Yep. Thanks, Martin. Uh, I'll try to share now. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. You. Okay. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Martin. Um, so hi, everybody. My name is Arvi Solon, and I'm the technical lead on the EcoCommerce platform. Uh, I'm based at Griffith University up in Brisbane. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about our journey to build uh, what we're thinking of a gen as generic research infrastructure. So a little bit of background uh, to start uh, to start with about EcoCommons. So part of the deliverables for our platform were to build on the success of the previous systems. So the the systems in EcoCommons kind of portfolio uh, range back all the way to 2014 when BCCVL, which is the Biodiversity and Climate Change Virtual Laboratory, was created. Um, and that's a, a platform that over these the year since 2014 has amassed on almost 5,000 users, or actually more than 5,000 users at the moment, uh, and has been a really great success in, in the ecosystem of actually allowing users to access that and run models and get outputs and visualize those outputs easily. Um, we also have EcoCloud, which is a command line environment for the cloud, um, where users can uh, log in and get a free a Jupyter Notebook server that can uh, uh, start up in, in the cloud and um, then have a pre-configured environment where they have all their packages and everything installed so they have nothing to do on their own computer but uh, to enable them to utilize cloud infrastructure and cloud compute uh, to do some of their analysis and work there. Um, we have EcoEd, which is the training part of uh, the ecosystem and also um, from in 2019 to early 2020, uh, the CSDM, which is the Collaborative Species Distribution 
modeling portal was built as a proof of concept, uh, utilizing some of the features from EcoCloud and BCCVL. So our brief was basically integrate the functionality of these are both systems that I, I just mentioned now, and but make it into a modern and reusable and extensible platform. So, right, that, that sounds easy enough. Um, it's, um, it's quite the kind of range of approaches we could have taken with how we wanted to implement this. So there was a lot of considerations we had to make, and I'll step you through some of the considerations we made here in, um, in our project. And just a little bit of background again, um, we're midway or just after midway in our project at the moment. So we were funded for three years. Um, we started uh, last year in May uh, officially uh, and been running now for um, almost yeah, 18 months. Uh, so that's what we have left as well. We have about 18 months left of the whole project. Um, we're currently open for um, early user testing. Uh, so we have a production version of our platform and we have external users on it testing it at the moment. And we are aiming for a launch, a public launch in November next year. So on to the next slide. So again, some of the major goals for the platform that we needed to achieve is one is that to provide access to trusted and curated data sets easily. Um, and also to provide access to a catalog of trusted models and workflows so that users can use the data sets that they have access to and have a set of model, uh, models or workflows or algorithms which they can use uh, this data in. And then enabling and creating, um, the creating and executing reproducible workflows that can be shared, reused and improved over time. So this is one of the core functionality of the system that anything the user does in the system, uh, we'll be able to reproduce it using those workflows, using the data. Uh, and we have to make sure we have the systems and the metadata and everything in place for the users to easily um, create these reproducible workflows and results. Here again, is just a little bit more visual image of um, uh, some of the things we were aiming for. So reproducible, so we needed to predictably re rerun a workflow um, that will process data in the exact same way each and every time. Um, we needed to be able to handle both simple and complex workflows. And um, another thing is that we wanted it to be as infrastructure agnostic as possible. So this means it should really be able to run anywhere uh, without difficult infrastructure or software requirements or lock-ins. Um, we wanted it to be scalable. So we want to be able to run on large clusters if necessary or scale out to handle lots of concurrent running jobs. Um, and we also wanted to use technologies and systems or components that's stable and battle tested, something that's already been used in similar uh, setups. Uh, so we are not the, um, the guinea pigs when trying to um, implement this, we use a tried and tested components to ensure a stable platform. So I'm going to go a little bit into our considerations. And first of all, I'm going to touch on functionality. So user stories and requirements documentation, that's your source of truth. So um, we had, in the first part of our project, we had developed um, all our requirements documents with detailing all the um, user stories or requirements for our platform. And this was based on what the, did the, in our case, it was based on what did the existing systems offer in functionality? Plus, what had the users been wanting to have from those platforms that was recorded through the support systems um, in those platforms? So, and then when we had the requirements, we also had to prioritize. So we used a, a simple paradigm where we categorize our requirements into must-haves, should-haves, and could-haves. So obviously must-haves are the most important uh, requirements. These are the you know, core foundations that we need to make sure that we fulfill and we implement in the platform to say that we have implemented this functionality. The should-haves and could-haves are less important and the system can still work and can still uh, operate without those, uh, but they would be nice to have. And the more of those you implement, the, the more kind of user satisfaction um, you probably will get. And 
Another important element here is to always focus on user-driven functionality. So um, this, um, like I say here, this is almost always true. So all your developments or features or functionality should come from user requests. This should be based on a use case, something a user needs your system to do. But the exception is um, that you could have innovation from your own team, from your own developers that actually creates a new, uh, new functionality that the user isn't aware of anymore. But this is more rare. So you will, when building a platform like this, you will, uh, if you're staying true to focusing on the user-driven requests and user-driven functionality, most of the times, I think you will uh, be more likely to hit the right spot of what you're developing. We also have to consider scalability and what really is scalability. So um, you have to determine how to architect your solution to allow scaling in the future. So uh, for example, in our case, separate components or platform parts needed to scale independently. So uh, I will show you a diagram later on how the platform is actually structured and how this structure allows these different parts of the platform to scale independently. And another tip here is to start off with a minimum of resources. So this means um, you don't have to scale up the compute resources straight away. It's actually better, uh, or in a way, it can be better to start with just the minimum resources that you need to get things running, but collect data and analytics to mes measure the usage. So how are the users using it? How much, what kind of compute is it using? Is it using a lot of memory? Is it using um, a lot of, uh, CPU cores, is it, does it need a lot of disk space? So once you get some um, data from actual users, you can study those analytics and optimize your resources based on that data. And the reason why I said to start with minimum resources is because then you're more likely to hit resource limits and actually see how the system performs when those limits are hit. So you might be able to um, identify some issues with your system. Maintainability was another big consideration. Uh, so we wanted to build a really uh, maintainable platform that could go on for a long time. And so if you're thinking about um, building a maintainable product, it means thinking ahead. And what does maintainable really means? For us, it means that we have documented code. Um, so we, add that we have project-wide code standards. Um, we have our functionality is tested and we're using automation where possible. So I'm talking about continuous integration and continuous de um, deployment. Um, and all our code goes through uh, automation processes and pipelines where code standards are verified, where tests are run before things are being deployed. And those kind of, um, kind of base level improvements make sure that the platform is less likely to have uh, silly bugs coming into it. And this also uh, leads into the question you can ask yourself, how easy is it for someone to come in and make changes or improvements? So this could be a new staff member, uh, a partner or collaborator who wants to add on or help out with the project. If they have a full test suite, if the code is documented, if the code is following standards, um, if it's running, uh, the automatic pipelines are running when they're pushing changes or merge requests, that makes it a lot easier for external collaborators to then with confidence push in changes um, to, to the project. Okay, next one is supportability. So this is something you need to consider who will provide support for your project, both now and in the future. You might not have a need right now, but it, it's good to think about who will actually be providing that support and also building in ability to handle support requests. Do you have a process for handling uh, support requests? Does the users have an easy way to contact the team? How can the users provide feedback? For example, in Eco Commons, we have implemented, we have a couple of widgets that the users can use to contact directly to support, to ask questions, to send email. And they also have um, a feedback widget where they can actually um, provide direct feedback with what they see on the screen. So they can draw and highlight things on the screen and uh, 
click of a button, it gets sent to our support team and we can uh, evaluate that um, user feedback right there with a screenshot and uh, stats and data like the browser details, screen size, those kind of things. Okay, so flexibility was another consideration. And what does flexibility really mean? And who is it flexible for? So should it be flexible for users? Should it be flexible for administrators or potential integrators or partners, people who want to use the system? So how far do you take building up flexible products? So there's not one answer here um, because you can go in many directions, but if you focus on your core value proposition, uh, for your product and, or platform uh, and making this easy to um, reuse or adopt for others, that's one way that could work. And that's the focus we're getting on, um, we're taking, where we make, we're focusing what we're good at, what we see is useful, um, and then really, really uh, narrowing down and making sure this is something other people can use and um, uh, kind of optimizing for many use cases for, for that. So um, less is more, that's another uh, little rule of thumb that we have. So we rather have solid functionality that's tested and works really well instead of too many features and there might be uh, kind of more bugs and not, or not so solid. Uh, last point on this is, is it gonna be infrastructure agnostic? Uh, do you containerize? Uh, so if you do those things, if you have those thoughts early um, it can allow for much greater flexibility if you need to move between infrastructure providers. And I'm just saying this as, for example, you, you might start on building on the research cloud, but what if um, there comes a need where this system needs to be run on a different infrastructure, such as AWS or any public cloud provider at the later stage? How does your code and uh, kind of deployment uh, setup allow for that? So sustainability. So for us, that has been like a big elephant in the room. We're building a platform, but we are a research project. We are only funded for uh, a certain amount of time. So how does a research project go about building a platform that can achieve sustainability? And this is for almost any R&D project. How do you go from an R&D project to an operationalized platform or product? So we don't know yet because um, we haven't finished our sustainability part yet, but we are on our way. And I think our kind of takeaway so far is like optimize for success. And that means increase your chances of reuse and integration. Keep talking to your stakeholders and potential collaborators to find out where you can bring value and where you can see overlaps between what different systems are doing and where you can see complementary functionality. So we have been seeing that a, a lot of platform projects kind of reinvent the wheel. They, they still, the core functionality of the platforms are really generic. And that's what we try to focus on to make sure we structure a platform in a way of what we're building so that it can be reused as much as possible. So that's our approach as well. Um, building generic and reusable platform foundations. So this is a set of generic components that can be reused or customized and easily adopted. It can be available as a platform, but also potentially eco-commons could be available as services inside other infrastructure. So this is due to our way we deploy things and things are how things are containerized. We keep in our options open and having this really flexible core that could be reutilized and redeployed in many forms. So on top of our generic and reusable foundations, we apply customizations. So these customizations are separated from the platform components to allow a loose coupling for integrators. So this greatly increases your chances of having po potential collaborators coming in and reuse what you've done because um, they can have their, their customizations are separate from your core product. So for example, at the moment, EcoCommons is um, integrating with the biosecurity commons and they are putting their customizations on top of the eco platform. They're actually deploying into the same infrastructure, but having their own customization in terms of design um, and, and defaults and workflows, and they can show the users exactly what they want, but they can still reuse what we've built. Another thing we're doing is, um, and we would recommend is to establish a feedback loop 
early and fast. So get users on the platform to test and provide feedback. The earlier you can get feedback from the users, the more time you'll spend on working on the most important fixes and features. And there's really no substitute from having actual users poke holes in your features and your system, because that will happen. That will absolutely happen. So no matter how much you internally test things, things when external users get their hands on it, that's when you get the real feedback that will uh, allow you to have um, a clear idea of what's working and what's not. So communicate, educate, and support. So develop support material and show this to your users inside the system, expose it to your users. Hold training sessions or record training videos on how users can use your product and promote these to the users. Don't have them tucked away in a uh, support site or a abandoned part of your website. Show it to the users inside the platform. Develop use cases that show how your product can be used in various use cases. And pro again, promote this to your users so they can see it and promote it in relevant places inside your platform. So that all leads to really onboard your users. So give your users the best chance of success by providing them with the best onboarding experience possible. Um, so a little bit more about the platform foundations here um, is that we have uh, the data explorer inside our platform that provides access to trusted linked and curated data sets. And we have a function catalog and modeling wizards that provides access to um, a catalog of trusted models and workflows. And we have a job manager that uses Slurm, Nextflow and Docker to produce scalable and reproducible function execution. So these are some of the core um, components of our platform. Here is, uh, High level overview of our platform. As you can see, we have uh, multiple clusters uh, on the platform. So this is one environment inside our platform. Uh, we have two Kubernetes clusters. One is the application cluster where we have our business logic. Uh, we have a Jupyter Hub cluster uh, on Kubernetes and we have a Slurm cluster. So these are all separate clusters so they can scale independently. So this was really important in our initial design to make sure that we build a scalable system that can handle uh, many different collaborators coming on to um, coming on to the system. So some lessons learned. I'm almost finished now. And um, one thing is that you need to consider that resource needs will vary over the project lifetime. For example, we are a three-year project. Um, and for us, development activities, front-end versus back-ends, those, those needs will vary. And it might not be constant. So it might be hard to have... Uh, a front end, like to to really know when do you gonna need front end uh, more front end loaded developers, uh, or when do you need more back end activities? Um, so it's important to structure the project as flexible as possible with that, so that you can try to ensure that you have enough resources. Resolve ambiguity early, so please try to avoid confusion and potential extra work by getting clarity on deliverables straight away. So when you implement, uh, inherit a pro project implementation plan, for example, we had a case in Eco Commons where um, we had a kind of an ambiguity where we had some deliverables around sensitive data, which turned out to be restricted data instead. And that was a big difference in our approach to how to handle that. So the earlier we uh, resolve that, um, the more we can focus on building the right things. And if building a platform, ensure sustainability is planned for and resourced appropriately. A sustain sustainability model needs to be developed and matured as you go along with the project. And you need to keep talking to your potential partners and funders because sustainability can't be an afterthought. That would likely lead to no sustainability. So you have to make sure that this is one of your main approaches and figuring out how you're gonna go from a research project onto being a sustainable product that can live by itself after this. How is the funding gonna be? How is it gonna be operationalized? Focus on what you can control. So basically we have a core team that's inside the Commons team and we have a team of collaborators with in-kind uh, contributions from partners and our core deliverables, the must haves, they are developed by our core team so that because we have more control of the resource of our core team and then we can allow other collaborators uh, to come in and um, help us with the must-haves and should-haves. Uh, no, the should-haves and could-haves, I'm sorry. Um, so that we keep in control, 
to make sure that we can deliver on our core deliverables. All right, that's it for me. I want to say a big thank you for listening to me and I want to acknowledge all our project partners as you see on this uh, on the screen here with all their logos. Thank you very much. It's wonderful, Arve. Thank you. I realize that's a, it's a lot to go through, isn't it, with the, with the big bills such as you're responsible for that. Um, our next speaker is Anna. Um, I wonder if, uh, Arve, you could stop sharing so that Anna could put her slides up. Yes. Give me a sec. Stop. No worries. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Anna. I'll hand over to you. Anna, I'm not sure if you started speaking already, but you might be on mute. Yes, I am. <laughs> I I know, just checking. Thank you. <laughs> the phrase of 2021, you are on mute. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Mm. Cool. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Anna Belgun, and I work in the 61 uh, engineering and design team. I specifically uh, work um, with the engineers and designers uh, in the 61 and stakeholders. Um, on delivering or developing uh, spatial digital twins platforms um, and other geospatial platforms. And I'm here today by invitation of the team, lovely team at uh, the Atlas, um, giving uh, an example of um, managing geospatial data, um, you know, within a digital twin. So I'll be talking about um, what is a digital twin? Um, probably everybody is already sick of this term, <laughs> um, but don't worry, metaverse is coming. So digital twin, uh, I'll try and uh, uh, summarize a bit of millions of definitions going around. Uh, I'll uh, then present a little bit about our um, the platform experience, our journey to um, develop digital twins. Some of the use cases, which I think are, re are relevant to um, the topic today of environment, uh, the traction of the open source, because that's what we are about, and a uh, quick summary if we have time. So it's quite a lot uh, to take in, so I'll try and um, uh, go through the, all the material, but please, Martin, uh, let me know if I'm going too fast or too slow. All right. <laughs> I'm trying. Um, so we hear, uh, as I said, a lot um, about digital twin and uh, digital twins in general. And the space that we are involved in uh, deals specifically with spatial digital twins. But in general, a digital twin is a virtual representation of real world entities. So it can be anything and processes. Think about modeling, synchronize the specified frequency think about time, and fidelity, right? So think about resolution. Um, and more simply, a digital twin is a digital representation, a model of something. So think about it uh, can be a building or a tree in the physical world and is connected to the physical world and is kept in correspondence. That's quite, that's the twinning date, right? So that's quite important to understand that it, um, we don't, um, think of digital twin just about, uh, in, just as uh, an infrastructure model, right? Um, a, a bridge or a building. To realize the connectivity, a digital twin usually includes built and natural environment information or data, live data, so think about sensors and context data, uh, just such as geospatial. As I said, there is, a, there, there is a lot out there. You will find a lot of definitions um, about digital twins, and I won't go into all of them. Um, but what we are involved in is obviously urban digital twins. Um, uh, I will talk a bit about the, the ecosystem, uh, the fact that it's spatially enabled, and the level of maturity of digital twins, or how to look at them from a maturity perspective. So I'll try and get through them. So at the end, hopefully you have um, uh, maybe a better understanding of a digital twin and you will know how to answer that question. 
Um, we think of a digital twin, um, we actually agree with what the Digital Build Britain came up with as a concept uh, of a national digital twin, but not as a national platform, if you, look, if, if you know what I mean. It's not a website that everybody goes to and finds everything in, in um, you know, a, a copy of the reality in there is more of an ecosystem of digital twins and because there is no one digital twin to rule them all. And um, you will see uh, the evolution of examples of evolution of that thinking in the example that I'll give uh, shortly. Um, again, another concept that I said we are um, perfectly aligned with in our work is the, is the fact that it's a spatially enabled digital twin. Um, I, we don't deal just with uh, an infrastructure model, model or a beam model. Um, everything is placed, um, you know, in a in a spatial in a spatial perspective. Uh, all the data is located correctly relative to each other and uh, with its real world context. That's basically what it means. And as you can see, there are many types of data sets that a digital twin will federate from, um, such as environment, social, economic, uh, commercial, obviously sometimes digital engineering, infrastructure, utilities, the IoT, which gives the, the live aspect of the digital twin. And they're all um, underpinned by spatial data. So think about cadaster, uh, boundaries or any other administrative positioning, um, elevation, um, you know, dam, lidar, and so on. And um, they are they are connected. Um, you know, they are each they are connected through standards and protocols, which uh, hopefully are as open as possible, and to give um, more opportunity. Uh, to developers and users and product owners in the di digital twin ecosystem to build tools and uh, modeling on top of those data sets. So that's why a uh, digital twin can never be the answer to everything because you can't build all the workflows that everyone needs um, to you know, perform their work. Um, and the maturity element of it um, is basically it, what it means in practice is that a digital twin is a journey, right? So you can't just buy a digital twin off the shelf. Um, you have to build it and you have to, um, you, you will always have elements of maybe each of the levels, but at the beginning you will never have all of the elements at one in one go. We started, a, a, you'll see in a second, but we started the journey of building a digital twin per se in 2018. But before that, there was another, you know, four or five years of working in this space before we reached the first prototype of a digital twin. And obviously, as I was mentioning in the spatial aspect of the digital twin, everything is based on our location. Um, you know, you always need quality mapping, precise positioning, accurate terrain, and definitely, definitely cadaster. Cadaster is, I can't stress enough how important that is. Um, another level of maturity is the visualization. So um, easy to use interfaces, um, you know, to inspect, uh, inspect, plan, engage, engage with the community, and uh, show different modeling um, tools. So you always need, um, you know, the 3D cadaster, which now the states are um, coming on board on, on digitizing their uh, cadaster databases and making them 3D and 3D reality models. Think about reality meshes and LIDAR <clears throat> photogrammetry data set. Again, the next level is the integration. Um, uh, so you integrate uh, static data with live data into into a federated model, basically. And um, again, energizing is the next level of that integration. Uh, Accentuation is a more, even a more complex level of maturity where you are able already to control the, the, um, the, the, the physical as uh, assets or the, the, twin, the digital um, 
um, yeah, the digital assets within the twin. And uh, obviously the, the most complex level of maturity is the automation, which involves in some aspects artificial intelligence and real-time data and advanced uh, analytics all in real time and based on the location um, and the context data. It's, it's a lot, so um, I welcome any questions at the end of today, but, and I'll have all the answers, obviously. Um, all right, so that's in a nutshell um, what, we what we understand, um, um, you know, as a digital twin, but I would like you to, as I was saying before, it has been a journey, definitely, and it started in um, 2014, basically. What happened in 2000, 2014 was that Google Maps, uh, sorry, Google Earth uh, decommissioned their uh, support for um, governments or for products. Um, there were basically two major players at uh, that time um, providing proprietary um, products to the government, not just in Australia, everywhere. So there was Esri and Google Earth. Google Earth decommissioned their product in 2015 as an enterprise alternative to Esri. And that's where, that's when governments uh, around the world, including Australia, were looking for alternatives in terms of, um, you know, developing solutions that are not, they, they all had the proprietary options and they all use them to this day. But I wanted also other options that would give them the freedom of uh, development, customization, and um, you know um, interoperability. Hence, um, the first attempt was to build an open source software. Teria Jazz was built at that time, and it was a very timid, um, I guess, attempt initially to federate. It was the first time we used federation. Federate open source, oh, sorry, open data sets from Department of Communications um, to show them in a, you know, in a more consumable way for the users because all you had in terms of open data were spreadsheets uh, or even worse, there were PDFs. So that was the first attempt to, okay, let's think about a way to make it easier for people to understand this information and consume it and obviously uh, use it in their business or in their daily lives. And that's how Terry HS was, was uh, initially um, born. Um, so based on Terry HS, we built National Map. Initially it has a dozen, it had a dozen of data sets. Um, and from then onwards, seeing the interest from, it was a three months prototype, by the way, uh, seeing the interest from different departments in the Australian government and then states, it grew as, a, um, as an ecosystem of platforms with based on open source principles. So the government wouldn't be locked into a particular technology um, based on federation. That was one of the major uh, attraction that a platform did not have um, that overhead of um, basically acquiring all the data and hosting the data and then you know working and processing the data to produce a new version and so on. It was based on pipelines directly into the data custodians uh, hosting environments and harvesting data uh, straight from them as web services or APIs. And we are using that principle to this day as much as, much as possible. Um, again, interoperability, open standards in terms of um, data formats, um, definitely OGC compliance. So think about web services um, like WMS, WFS, and everything in between. But it also supports, uh, to this day, ESRI formats because that's the uh, main uh, web service uh, type used by every government department in the world. So it's normal to talk to um, any system and any data set, hence the you know, interoperability. Anyway, long story short, starting in 2014 with National Map and Terry Jess and continue this journey, um, which was kind of organic. Um, 
we had, uh, because it's based on cesium, which is inherently a visualization of the globe and 3D data. It had that since 2014, but nobody was using it. However, the, um, the concept of digital twin uh, started uh, catching up and the, the, the technology and the platform was already there. Um, so you could always add 3D data sets if they had uh, an open um, standard like 3D tiles. And from then on, you can add you know, live data and modeling and so on. And that's why it was a, one of the preferred ways to start thinking and building and prototyping the digital twin with New South Wales government. That they, were, they were the champions and promoters. And it grew to Queensland Digital Twin, um, Digital Earth, which is based on satellite imagery, and more recently, Digital Twin Victoria, which will be launched uh, soon. Um, this is, um, I'll, I'll just go quickly uh, through the examples. This is a national map view. Uh, they're all public, so you can, apart from Digital Twin Victoria, they're all public. You can go to their websites and check their, you know, the, the breadth of data sets. This one has around 14,000 data sets, probably the highest number of users per month. It's not centrally, but it's not bad either. Um, so it has a lot of people. And the groups that you'll find are usually um, public servants um, trying to, you know, um, um, develop briefs or policies or understanding the data they are working with. Um, so government uh, researchers uh, publishing their data and also demonstrating their data and the results of the, um, of the research they've done. Um, education institutions, so a lot of um, high schools and schools have contacted us, um, you know, showing interest in the data and, and telling us how they use it. Um, general public. Um, there are a lot of people looking at the national map and consuming the data, and not ultimately industry. The most probably prominent case um, in the industry, in the, with the industry use cases, where is it? I just want to take you straight there, uh, is of companies looking to, um, for example, plan uh, next developments and. They were, they, were, they were giving us stories about how before National Map they were overlaying physically uh, data uh, printed on, um, you know, paper uh, to, understand, to understand where the infrastructure is or where the um, environment areas, you know, environment protected areas are. So they can, you know, shortlist the sites for development and Neoin, which is a French company, um, investing heavily in Australia, um, contacted us saying that, you know, when a data set uh, like transmission lines in electricity doesn't work, they can't basically do their job. So that's really encouraging that all this effort put into the open data sets, sorry, open uh, standards, interoperability actually has a use. Um, I'll go quickly. Uh, to the next uh, slide, which is a short presentation of the New South Wales Digital Twin. Again, it's a federated. We might system. run this up fairly soon, if that's if that's all okay. right. Have you got some um, concluding points you could you yeah, can show, yeah. share with the audience? Yes. Um, all I can say is that people can go to um, Terry AJS and Magda, which are the two underlying uh, libraries used for developing a digital twin or a mapping platform like National Map. There are a lot of organizations out there in the world that we know of, but also there are, uh, that we don't know, uh, that have built their own platforms using, without us, using the code. And um, they can look at the um, teria.io or, or magda.io websites for examples of applications. Lovely, thank you, Anna. And sorry to have to cut you off there. It's just- No uh, problem, no problem, I understand. There is, uh, one of the challenges of, of asking people to talk about this this infrastructure is the, the sheer breadth and, and interest that there is in it and the amount that could be covered in any one uh, in any one talk but thank you for that it's really cool no, um, so, uh, miles so handing over to miles from the atlas of living australia um and if you could stop sharing your slides so that miles could share his 
then we uh, we have time for our last speaker. Um, and while Miles is doing that, um, I should say to the audience that we um, may not have as much time as we normally do for a discussion at the end, which is a bit of a shame, but one of those things. If, um, uh, feel free to continue to ask your questions, however, uh, and we'll see if we can post some answers after the event. Uh, Miles, over to you. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, everybody. Um... So I can probably cover off the main points of my talk reasonably quickly, make sure I've got some time for questions because that's one of the more interesting bits. So what I'm going to do is have a chat about managing data quality in the Atlas of Living Australia. So the ALA is, for anyone who's not as familiar with it, uh, is a data aggregator. So we bring together information about biodiversity. One of the main parts of it is the occurrence data store. Um, it's an aggregated data set of over 100 million occurrence records provided by 830 data sets and growing with time. These data sets are provided by uh, museums, herbaria, government agencies, citizen science groups, research organizations, and even individuals can submit individual records. So what we've got is a large data set from lots of different places that was collected for lots of different reasons, using lots of different methodologies, using lots of different tools. Uh, we have data that goes back to the early 1700s. So we've got things from very old journals that was collected on paper, all the way through to stuff that was collected yesterday using a, an app of some sort on somebody's mobile phone. So there's a lot of different types of data in there. So because of this variety, we get concerns about the quality of the data that people are accessing. So this has been fairly consistently raised with the Atlas, since the Atlas started, basically. In 2019, the Atlas did a national consultation process. We spoke to about 100 people and asked them about strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats for the Atlas. And data quality came up as a weakness, a threat, and therefore as an opportunity. So the weakness was that data quality and assessing fitness for purpose can be difficult. There's a threat that there's a reputational risk if the data is seen as of poor quality. And so there's an opportunity for us to deliver curated quality assured data to users so that uh, it can be used for research and um, decision support. So, okay, so based on this, we needed to look at data quality. So what does this actually mean? When we're told there are data quality issues, um, what does this more specifically mean to users of the Atlas? So we ran two surveys. The first one was a baseline. Uh, we needed to get a figure of what did people think of the actual level of the quality of the data in the Atlas. So if we make some changes, we've got something to measure against. And also, you know, we, we hear that there are data quality issues, but this is from a subset of the users. And um, what, what does the more broader ALA user base think? Also ran a second survey that asked, so, we know there are data quality issues. What are the actual things we should work on? So the problem that came back from these two surveys was essentially that lower quality data gets used along with higher quality data, either because users don't know the data needs to be filtered or because they don't know how to filter it. So how are we going to address this? What we, what we looked at doing was putting in place default data filters that exclude lower quality records from initial query results. So what used to happen was that if you did a query, you got all the data. And then it was assumed that you would then assess the data that you've gotten back and make a decision to take subsets of that out because you considered it unsuitable for your particular purpose. So basically, it took an action to filter out the lower quality data. What we put in place, and I'm going to switch to the actual atlas itself was this box up the top here, which uh, explains the pre-filtering we're doing. So because we changed paradigm, we had to make it very obvious that we are pre-filtering data for you. So you can see that of 100,000 records, you're getting 87, sorry, not 100,000, 100 million records. You're only getting 87 million back. This box here shows you what's happening. So we are excluding records based on a set of queries that we put over the top of the data. So we're flipping that previous paradigm. We're removing the lower quality records by default. It is going to take you an action to include lower quality stuff back in again. Uh, very quickly running through this, a big part of it was making sure we 
had a lot of metadata. So um, all of the sets of filters have full sets of metadata describing both in relatively plain English and technical terms what uh, the individual query groups do. There, you can view the records that have been excluded by a particular query. There are multiple sets of pre-filters, um, including one for the CSDM program, as mentioned before in the um, in Abe's talk. Um, there's another one here around licensing. So you can use these filter sets, not just for data quality purposes, but to actually produce data sets that are suitable for particular types of analysis, or in this case, stuff that's open license that could be used, for example, by commercial organizations. You can also switch them off. So if you decide you don't actually want these in place, you can turn them off and um, go about managing the data yourself. There's a setting box where you can actually set your own defaults as well. So I prefer to have this profile as my default and um, have this perhaps have this box collapsed. So that's very, very quickly what that does. All of these filters can be broken out and you can work with them at a very fine grained level to turn bits and pieces of them on and off. I won't go into any more detail on that. Okay, so we put that solution in place. Next question was, did this actually make a difference? So we were trying to address people's perceptions of the quality of the data they were accessing. So from the survey we ran uh, before we did the work is the, the chart on the left. So the percent of responses and where they rated the, the data quality. So it's a fairly shallow curve. Um, the actual average score came in in the high threes, basically, which was probably a little higher than we expected it to, even before we did any work, just based on the feedback we'd gotten that there was this perception of issues with data quality. Um, after we did the project, what was interesting was this big jump. Um, and essentially what's happened is a percentage of the users that thought the data was average quality have moved to a high quality um, measure. They, they now think the data is of high quality compared to they used to think it was average quality. So we had some stats that basically said we, we made a difference by doing this work. So what's next? Um, so another part of that, that post-project survey we did was to ask what we should look at next. And essentially there are still issues. Um, we've put the filtering in place and that does a good job of cleaning up a lot of the, um, filtering out a lot of the, the lower quality data, but some of it is still there. The best example we have of this is this thing that happens where people see um, most of the data is really, really good. But there is a small subset of records that are appearing correct. And based on that, they will make a, an assertion that because there are small, a small number of records that appears wrong, the whole data set is suspect. And so the example I've got here is Osteranthus robustus, which is the common one root. Uh, as I understand it, doesn't occur in Victoria or in, in these area, Victoria here that I've highlighted in this, this one down in the bottom left. There are seven dots on the map representing 200 records out of 42,000. But based on that, um, comments are made that, as you can see here, there are some records that are wrong. The, you have to be careful using the data in the atlas. So what are we going to do about this one? Um, the first thing we're going to do is look at what we refer to as expert distribution outlier detection. So um, based on distribution maps provided by experts in particular species, we put these over the occurrence points and then flag the ones outside of those distributions as being suspect. And we use the filtering functionality that we already built to take them out of the default results. At the moment, we only have distributions for fish provided by the Australian National Fish Collection and for birds provided by BirdLife International. So bottom left there is the little winged kite. Top right is the gray nurse shark. We've got a number of distributions for those. So we're currently working on getting a processing pipeline that when data is loaded, it bounces all the occurrence records for a particular species against the distribution for that species and then excludes those records. So that's the first thing we're doing. Um, more broadly, so that's the first thing we're doing, and more broadly in terms of how the Atlas is addressing data quality at the moment, first thing we're trying to do is present what we refer to as a trustable data set. It's going to have less records in it, but it should look a lot better, and we're trying to reduce or eliminate instances of there is a small number of records here that look wrong, the whole data set is suspect. That's the first thing we're doing. Then what we're going to try and do is find how can we improve those records to bring them back in again. So that's basically um, 
either sending them back to the owner of the data set saying these racial records have problems, or some of them we can detect and potentially fix automatically. So for example, records that are missing a negative on their latitude. There's like a, an upside down Australia that's there if you go looking for it. Um, so we can potentially fix those with an automated process. The other thing we're looking at doing is to capture and report on processing history of data, particularly important for government agencies or others who use the data for decision support. Uh, if you want to help us out, we're very always interested in uh, users of the Atlas providing us input on what their priorities are, um, helping us design solutions to fix those things, testing and verifying the solutions we build, and um, anyone out there that has distribution maps that we can use, um, you know, birds and fish are reasonably well covered, but that leaves everything else. So anyone who's got distribution maps, that kind of stuff, we would um, love to work with you to, to potentially use those. Uh, you can contact either um, myself or the, the data quality project at the data quality at ala.org.au. And I will wrap up there. Lovely, thank you for that, Miles. It was really interesting. And thanks to all our speakers today, actually. That was a really fascinating set of talks. Look, we're, we're quite close to time. I, I, I'm going to chance one question, just in the, in the spirit of having a bit of a discussion. Um, so, look, and, and I'm also this is the panel, so any of you feel free to answer. Um, each of you talked about, about um, sort of, I only use the term federated systems, right? So this idea that people working together, and the Atlas is an example of that as well, where we bring together data from lots of different people. But then there's also this, this um, uh, sort of a contrary view of, of a more curated or controlled ecosystem. And I guess Mars's projects is an example of an attempt to try and move towards more of a, um, a clean system. Arve's, you could argue, is the same. Um, do, you, do you have any views on the, the strengths and weaknesses of each or what's going to be possible in the future? Is federated inevitable as data gets more complex? Um, what are your thoughts on this? I'm happy to... Oh, sorry. Yeah, you go, go first. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll be quick, I promise. Um, we realize that uh, it will always be um, a combination, right? But uh, because, because we've seen the power of federation, i.e. each product owner of a, of a data platform uh, has less costs basically incurring with management of the data. Like they don't have to host 13,000 data sets. However, because obviously uh, sometimes the quality or dependency on the uh, uptime of the services from the data custodians is relative, there are issues with those, right? And um, the platforms cannot control them. You are basically, uh, the, uh, you know, um, um, you are dependent on the data custodians. What we did was, um, thinking about, okay, we want to increase and have maybe, um, you know, uh, around 80% of the data federated, you know, the bulk of the data federated. And when it makes sense for the data sets to be hosted and uh, extremely curated, then we will allow that to happen. Like we are not going, um, you know, um, to say that 100% of the data will always be federated. That's how I think it's a case by case scenario. But the idea is have as much as possible and as much as it makes sense federated and then add the curated bit for you know what makes sense to be hosted and curated. Ave, did you have something you want to add to that? I think I agree with everything uh, she just said. And I just, one quick thing is all about like how can we help the users um, discover the data and enable them and educate them so we can, um, maybe it's not with the federated model, it allows the users to have a better user experience to easier uh, provide easier access to these data sets, but it brings up the challenges with data quality and you know real, reliability and suitability, but that's where we can help as well by educating and providing support materials and guides and those kind of things. Lovely. Mars, I can open that up further if you'd like. <laughs> One one part I kind of skipped over a bit was actually why we filter data rather than reviewing it and not loading it beforehand. Um, there's issues of scalability there, but it's also because um, if the data is not available in an open platform, like um, like the Atlas, for example, there's no opportunities for other people to see it and potentially improve it. Or we also don't know what that data might be useful for in the future. So it might not 
be useful or be suitable for some of the analysis that, that people want to use it for now. But there's plenty of things that data is used for that people never thought of when it was collected. Totally. And what a what a positive note to end on as well. I, I like that idea of a future where we could do all sorts of things that we don't know are possible now. Unfortunately, though, we're out of time. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, especially to our speakers, for those really informative talks. And we've, um, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you.